All right, everybody. It looks like it's about time to start. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today for uh, this webinar on the safety manual and overview therein. Uh, uh, today we're going to have Jared Stanley speaking as well as Mike Vaughn. And uh, just a couple things before we start. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming to see this uh, webinar on the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, we're actually doing an overview, or actually I'm not, but uh, the presenter Jared Stanley and Mike Vaughn are going to share with us uh, what they know about the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, so we'd like to thank them as well as David Derman for supporting them uh, in this uh, webinar. Just a couple of things before we get uh, farther along. If anybody wants to see past webinars, we actually have a significant number of past webinars on different varying subjects that probably anybody can find something of interest to them. You can actually find them on the Highway Design Software and Support page. If you go into Google and actually type in Highway Design Software and Support, it should take you to this link. Um, or you can actually make it through the Highway Design website. Uh, but if you look down here where this big red arrow is through the highway design website, you can go to the software and support link and get to those web webinars, old webinars. Um, lots of time spent and lots of information there for anybody who might want it. Uh, if anybody has any questions about uh, microstation inroads project-wise, uh, you can contact us here at KYTC CAD support ky.gov excuse me here and uh, at this point I'm not sure if we've ever not been able to answer a question it might not be at the in the time you want it most of the time it's a quick quick solution but uh, most of the time I think we've always been able to answer questions uh, that's no in no part by me but the others who work with me who are very intelligent over here so thank you to them a couple of reminders, you can get professional development hours for this webinar. This webinar is actually going to be a little longer, depending on how long it is, you may get more than an hour, probably will get more than an hour, but uh, I'm not sure how much more. So I'm actually going to send out your development hour certificates here, with probably within a week after today. Um, but you, you have to be present for the entire webinar to get your PDH uh, hours. Um, you can watch it as a group if you're all together. Um, we are on an honor system here in Kentucky. I would highly suggest, though, that you use a sign-in sheet and get a copy of it so you have evidence of your attendance. Um, also, at the end of this webinar, we're going to have a survey. And some, if you please uh, would answer that survey. This is the first webinar we've had in a while just because of differing issues and, and lack of subject content. Uh, but if you could answer that, uh, answer the questions in those survey, that would help us out to, uh, we're trying to get the webinars back up and going again. So again, we're glad to see you again if you're here, and if it's your first time, uh, we're glad to see you too. For anybody who's uh, daring enough to try to set up a microphone so they can ask questions with their voice instead of uh, just typing in questions, because you actually have the ability to type in questions during and after the webinar, well, I guess during, because after the webinar it will shut down. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you can actually set up your microphone if you go into the uh, audio section of your of your control panel. You can actually set up your microphone. This is actually a different screen. I need to update this. Um, they've actually updated their graphics, but it should be similar. It's similar to this. Um, we don't have any handouts. If you're looking here, we don't actually don't have any handouts for this uh, webinar, but. Uh, in, in future webinars, I'm sure we will. But if anybody wants to try to use their microphone, they're more than welcome and they can actually ask their question uh, over the webinar. All I ask is that you you be polite to others out there who may find uh, offensive language, well, offensive, uh, at any rate. Uh, 
you can do that. First, let's uh, go through uh, a couple of poll questions. And these are standard questions if you've been here before. I've actually shortened it to one question because it answers both questions in the same way. So the first one is, is how many webinars have you attended? Give us some time for people to answer. <clears throat> Oh, excuse me. I'm apologize for doing that on the mic. I have a little bit of a cold today, so I apologize. Looks like we've actually got uh, about 92% uh, participation. And uh, if you look, we actually it looks like 20% of you have actually been great, greater than 10 women with ours. That's awesome. We're glad you're here. Glad. Thanks for coming back. And only 13% haven't been for the first time. For those of you who are new to webinars, thank you for coming. Uh, we hope you come again. Uh, this is uh, something that we're, again, we've been neglecting and uh, we're hoping to get back into. Thanks for coming. And for those of you who've been to, to fewer ones, we hope you come to more and are in that uh, greater than 10% or greater than 10 webinars here soon. <clears throat> okay, so let's go on to the web, uh, excuse me, yeah, to the presentation, the webinar. And let's see if Jared's ready. Jared, are you ready there? I am. Okay, Jared, here you go. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, excited to be here to talk a little bit about the Highway Safety Manual this morning. I know it's a topic that uh, a lot of folks are really asking a lot of questions, and it's uh, something that you want to know a lot more about. So. Uh, I'll just go ahead and get started here because we got a pretty lengthy presentation. I will say in the beginning that uh, will you be able to use the Highway Safety Manual in depth after today's session? Probably not, but hopefully you'll understand a lot more about the basics of the Highway Safety Manual and what sections pertain to your job duties. So what is the Highway Safety Manual? Uh, it's really like the Highway Capacity Manual, and it's used in a much similar fashion. Uh, for those of you that do not know, uh, the Highway Safety Manual was originally supposed to be part of the Highway Capacity Manual, but after much uh, discussion and deliberation, it was decided that this document probably needs to stand on its own. So it's, it's not really like the MUTCD or the Green Book, but it, it does describe the mathematical relationship for safety performance based upon exposure and roadway conditions. So in layman's terms, what that means is we're able to quantify either in dollars or in crashes uh, the improvements or the detriments of the decisions we make during the design process. It is an analysis tool, just like the Highway Capacity Manual, and it does not have standards, nor does it have best practices. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff in the Human Factors Guide, but that's really not a best uh, practice guidance and there's not a lot of that stuff uh, inside the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, it does not supersede other publications. Uh, it's, it's to be used in conjunction with uh, all these other tools to help you make decisions about your projects. But why do we need it? Uh, because we need to integrate safety into project decision-making processes. That means we need to understand uh, the detriments or the effects that we, the decisions that we make during design or planning what that will have on, on safety. So safety is just one of the things that you uh, really want to think about in your, your process when you develop your projects. Um, you know, it's, it's much like a lot of these other things. I know much, many of you have uh, been part of Mr. Bill Julek's uh, presentation where he has all these different facets of project management and you have to, uh, you have to make decisions based on which one of these is more important, and, and that's that's what safety is. It's just another piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, in the past, we've really considered crashes, but we haven't considered our design. So uh, what we're asking now is that we have the Highway Safety Manual that we're able to make some of those decisions and quantify those decisions that we make. But it's just like the environment, right away, utilities, you know, connectivity. It's just things that all blend together in your project development. So one of the reasons that we're really excited to have you guys on board and one of the reasons I want to show you this slide is that uh, in 2005, Kentucky ranked sixth 
uh, in the nation for uh, fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled um, at 2.08. And then in 2013, after uh, you know an economic downturn and the uh, intensification of some projects from the Highway Safety Improvement Program, uh, we saw a slight downward trend, and and we got to 1.36, which you know, hey, that's a large improvement, 2.08 to 1.36, but we still are 13th as of 2013. Um, in order to really move into the uh, middle of the pack or even above the middle of the pack, we have to really start using the Highway Safety Manual and make decisions on the planning and design uh, edge to, to really get us somewhere in the middle. So what's the purpose of the Highway Safety Manual? It's to quantify the effect of decisions, and it also helps you with uh, performance measurement or accountability for the decisions that you make. And really, I just wanna, I know you, this is a hot buzzword, and I'm not gonna read all this stuff to you. This is just a list that I kinda, uh, I stole from another location about performance-based practical design. But some of the things that really stood out to me is, is agencies are able to make sound decisions based on performance analysis. That means we're able to quantify the decisions that we make. Um, the PBPD strengthens the uh, planning level corridor or system performance. It really helps you in scoping. Uh, it helps you to understand your project and, and understand what is more important. You know, if you have a congestion project and you're looking at safety or if you have a safety project uh, and it's at the forefront, that's, that's really what PBPD is, is able to do, is able to give you a, a little bit more sharper focus. Um, but the most important thing is, it, you know, just like using the Highway Safety Manual, it does not eliminate uh, existing design standards. And I think that's something that we want to point out is, and, you know, we want to really uh, just aid or be a part of that total package. So where does it fit in system management or, you know, everyday process for the transportation cabinet? Um, you can see that it can be used in system planning for long-range transportation plans, and we're already working with John Moore on some of that stuff with the Shift 50, uh, you know, plan, project planning, corridor studies, and uh, alternative evaluations. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that with things like the IHSDM. Um, it helps with uh, final design, uh, designing a new facility, and system upgrades, and it can also be used in operations and maintenance. Uh, and we'd like to get this out there somewhere down the road, uh, talking about signal timing or traffic impact studies. So the, the big shift in uh, data analysis is moving away from critical rate factor and moving to potential for crash reduction. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about the really the, the moment that we realized that uh, we kind of needed to move away from critical rate factor. And, and we were at a safety engineers peer exchange and there was a presentation where a gentleman uh, was talking about a roadway in Colorado and said roadway, roadway A, had a critical rate of 1.5, let's say. And what happened was they built a casino and they saw this huge spike in crashes, but they also saw a huge spike in volumes. So the critical rate was actually uh, after this time period, after the, the casino had been built there three or four years is actually like a 1.4. And so his conclusion was casinos are great for highway safety. But what we realized out of that presentation was that, you know, using critical rate factor only takes us so far. Uh, we realized that it's not acceptable to have a high number of crashes just because we have a high volume. So that's why we really wanted to move toward implementing the highway safety manual and a lot of our network screening and, and HSIP is, moving to this potential for crash reduction. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But one point I do want to make is that, you know, just like uh, it's pretty obvious that you don't breathe underwater, uh, that the highway safety manual may not be necessary on every project. If you have a bridge replacement project, um, you know, you may not need to, to have a full depth analysis on the highway safety. So it's, it's not for everything, but it can be a part of most everything that you do. So what's the difference? Uh, why should we use the Highway Safety Manual? Well, we have something called nominal safety, and then we have substantive safety. And, and the difference between those two is uh, one is talking about compliance with standards or guidelines, and the other is talking about uh, expected or actual crash frequency 
for a particular roadway. And if you graph these two, it sort of looks like this, where you have uh, nominal safety, it's absolute, either you are meeting or you are deficient. But with uh, the Highway Safety Manual, we can quantify on a line uh, based on our uh, lane widths, or radius of curves, or stopping site distance, and the risk for crashes. We can look at those two things and we can derive uh, a breakpoint or a decision-making tool where we can uh, use this and, and quantify how we want to proceed with our projects. So it's great for alternative comparisons. Uh, these are several different cross sections that you may see, and this is just one component or, or the ability to analyze projects in one manner. And, and Mike Vaughn's going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. But you can see the same ADT. You can expect different uh, crash numbers for your crash frequencies. And the Highway Safety Manual helps you or aids you in that decision making. So the most important thing is that the Highway Safety Manual uh, it, learn to talk crash. You know, a lot of times I hear folks say use the term accident, or, and we really want to get away from that because uh, you know accidents can be avoided. Crashes are something that we really have to think about in terms of, of risk or risk mitigation. So, the basis for everything in a highway safety manual is crash frequency. And you know, when you hand someone the highway safety manual, uh, sometimes they get a uh, they, their response is a lot like scratches here uh, when he looks at this manual it's it's kind of overwhelming but what we hope to do today is kind of break that down a little bit for you and show you what may be pertinent to your job duties and and what may not be pertinent and then have have you understand how other people use other parts of the manual but we we don't want you to have this response so you have four different uh, parts Part A is uh, the introduction, of course, and the human factors. Uh, part B is safety management. Part uh, C is the predictive method. And Part D is crash modification factors. So I'll talk about the first couple of parts. Uh, and Mike's going to talk about Part C and D in depth, because that's going to be something that's a little more uh, pertinent to your job duties. But really, the, the first part is, is the human factors. Um, and, and really, the Human Factors Guide, even though it's, it's not really a best practices, uh, what it is is it, it gives you a chance to, uh, to have informed decisions or, or have data that, that you can take a look at. And I'll show you a little bit more about that later. But basically, uh, what's in the Highway Safety Manual has been expanded upon. And you can look at NCHRP Report 600 for the, uh, the newest revision on the Human Factors Guide. Then you move into the part B, which is the network screening. That is a large part of, of HSIP. We screen our roadway network. Uh, you also have diagnosis and countermeasure selection, which is, again, uh, something that's heavily rooted in, in HSIP. Uh, you may use a little bit of uh, economic appraisal and prioritization for projects uh, if you are in planning. Uh, you could also use it in design for, uh, for some comparisons of the build versus no build. Uh, and then you move into the safety effectiveness evaluation, and that again, that's HSIP. Uh, our, we have we have to write an annual report to the, the feds, and a lot of our projects have to have a, a safety evaluation. So that's another part of of HSIP. Then you start to move into Part C and D, which is uh, way more pertinent to a lot of design and, pl and planning functions. Uh, you start talking about things like safety performance functions and crash modification factors. Those are things that you're going to hear a lot about later on from Mike. It also has applications, example problems. And then you move to Part D where you you have the ability to apply crash modification factors for uh, different scenarios or, or, or different uh, projects like intersections, interchanges, roadway segments, or roadway networks. So really, some of the tools that are available um, so Part B, you know, planning and HSIP, uh, we are a, a large user of Part B. Part C, you may have heard of something called the Interactive Highway Safety Design Module or the IHSDM. This is a software that allows you to uh, load uh, roadway models and will give you an analysis based on uh, the roadway uh, characteristics that you have chosen. 
And then you have the crash modification clearinghouse, which is a, a, a clearinghouse or a warehouse, a storage uh, for all the crash modification factors for different treatments. So part A, the human factors guide, you know, the really the important thing that you, you, you take out of all this is it's factual information and it's insight of roadway users and, and how roadway users perceive uh, roadway attributes. So what we're trying to do here with the uh, human factors uh, guide is, is just manage the risk. And this is something that we would love to implement into our design processes, you know, somewhere down the road. But for right now, if we can get you guys acquainted with Part C and D, uh, later on we can really use the Human Factors Guide to implement maybe some uh, some ideas or, or policy shifts. So here's just a couple of things that you may find in the Human Factors Guide. One of these is uh, talking about gap for uh, an unsignalized intersection. Another is the perception of roadway versus, uh, based on vertical and horizontal curvature. And, you know, of course, they have some charts here that, that give you some ideas about uh, the ranges of which you should use one or the other. And uh, then just a visual guide here. So uh, the big basis of, of Part A is, is processing information. You know, there are lots of roadway attributes and, and maybe different users out there and, and how are those perceived and how, how are those interact and how do we mitigate that risk. Part B, uh, this is really the meat and potatoes of, of HSIP. Uh, it's the network screening, and we use this uh, extensively for uh, project prioritization. Uh, we, we used it in the roadway departure plan that we compiled. Uh, we use it in our development of the strategic highway safety plan, which is the document that covers all the safety in the cabinet, be it engineering, enforcement, education, or emergency services. And as you can see, we uh, have roadway departure corridors and intersections, the two lists that some of you guys may be familiar with from a district standpoint. You know, all that has its basis in the network screening that we accomplish. So these are some annual uh, project prioritization or network screenings that we compile. Uh, cable medium barrier, we uh, use roadway elements, uh, median type, uh, roadway type has to be an interstate. And, and we rank those based on uh, uh, the cr crash frequency that we've experienced in the past, and, and we look for a specific type of crash, a crossover crash. Uh, roadway departure corridors, we look at uh, rural two-lane high-speed facilities, uh, look for uh, roadway departure crash types. Intersections, uh, we, we look at, we have an intersection database that has every intersection spatially, geospatially tied throughout the state, and, and we snap the crashes uh, to those particular locations. Um, we also complete a list because we have uh, listed in our strategic highway safety plan a emphasis area for commercial motor vehicles. We, we also create a list every year of commercial motor vehicle uh, crashes. Uh, we have not prioritized projects from that yet. We just really use it for informational purposes only for education and enforcement. Uh, and of course we have high friction service treatments where we use ramps or segments of roadway and we cross-reference those with wet weather crashes. So uh, to have you, to move you into the highway safety manual lingo a little uh, deeper, we have what's called the CABCO system. So the K crashes are of course a, a fatality the A is a incapacitating injury. The B is a non-incapacitating injury. C is a possible injury, and O is a uh, property damage only. And and these uh, these are this is the spectrum of a way of prioritizing or or siloing crashes that occur. And if if you're looking for a short way, Tom Welch, uh, who is probably the godfather of safety, he was the safety engineer in Iowa for years, he used a little short term where he would say K is killed, A is ambulance, B is bloody, C is they're complaining, or O is of course is a property damage only. So that's the way uh, that we weight crashes based on what's called a severity index. So to move deeper into the highway safety manual, there's something that we use called uh, the regression to the mean, um, and I'll show you a little bit about why we do that. Because if you look at crashes uh, historically, you're going to see peaks and valleys along the way. And 
what happens is you, you don't want to fool yourself or you want to get a true idea of what's expected out there or the expected average crash frequency, this line. Um, a good example of this is a project that they are a section of roadway in Ohio where um, it was identified and then they identified some countermeasures and three years later they went back to look at the number of crashes per year and what they found was that uh, the crashes had reduced so someone asked well what did we do out there and the answer was well we didn't do anything what had happened was you were looking at a small snapshot of time and you were moving from here to there and you actually thought you had made an improvement or an improvement had taken place but what they what they needed was a much more expansive look at the crash data and once you have this crash data plotted uh, you can figure out an expected average crash frequency and the good thing about this is that you don't want your 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 improvements that you are going to implement whether it be crashes per year or in dollars you don't want those to be overstated so let's say that you know, you look at year X and and then you look at year Y and you think, hey, I've made all this improvement here. But really when you start looking at the regression to the mean, the, the improvement is is much smaller. Which is a good thing. I mean it gives it, it tells us the truth. It doesn't lie to us. It doesn't overstate what actually took place. So the most important thing is is knowing that when you use the highway safety manual, uh, you're you're accounting for regression to the mean and you're getting a, a, a more true average. So it looks a little something like this. Let's say this is a safety performance function, which may be a little foreign to you now, but hopefully by the end of the session you'll understand a little bit uh, more in depth. But this is uh, ADT and crashes per year, and this is a model that we uh, that best fits a number of crashes. And let's say that this is this is a point. This is a given ADT, and we predict that this is a number of crashes that are going to take place. Uh, if we take a look at a certain roadway, what we may find is the observed crashes are are uh, much higher, or there are much more of them. But the empirical Bayes methodology, or the regression to the mean, actually kind of weights these two and, and gives you something in the middle, that way that you get a truer sense of, of what the average may be. So what we uh, the term that we give this is PCR, or potential for crash reduction. And this is the basis for a lot of the uh, metrics that are used in a highway safety improvement program. So we can actually tell you in a quantifiable number, and it's number of crashes per year, uh, the potential for crash reduction based on what's observed uh, versus what is predicted in the model. And keep in mind the model, uh, this line here is established from several, several data points. So you're just looking at a given ADT and a given roadway segment here. So how's the highway safety manual being used? Right now, HSIP uh, uses it for network screening. We have used some of the uh, HSIP methodology for uh, the Shift 50 or the network prioritization with John Moore. Uh, we're continuing to improve that as, as data improves and, and understanding improves. Um, we have toyed with using the IHSDM uh, in a project with the uh, University of Kentucky. and uh, so that's something that's kind of in the intermediary. Uh, and then a project decision based on alignment and sections. I've got this red, but we've actually run through this in a sample project again with the University of Kentucky of where we have a research project for implementation of highway safety manual and we're just looking at some of the results. And we've been working with uh, Joe Asher in a project in District 5 to look at some of the outcomes there as a kind of a, a, a run through or a test project. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Vaughn, and he's going to talk a lot more in depth about Part C and D of the Highway Safety Manual. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's Mike Vaughn. Uh, as Jared said, I'll be discussing Part C and Part D of the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, I've got a lot to cover, so uh, let's just jump right to it. Okay, so volume two of the Highway Safety Manual is where you'll find Part C, the predictive methods. Part C only has three chapters, chapters 10, 11, and 12, but Part C is the largest of all three parts. Um, there's a lot of info in Part C. 
Uh, the three chapters cover the safety performance functions and the specific crash modification factors that can be used to predict crashes along different roadway types. Chapter 10 deals with rural two-lane roads. Chapter 11 deals with rural multi-lane highways. And Chapter 12 deals with urban and suburban arterials. It's important to realize that uh, crash modification factors presented in Part C are specific to the safety performance functions they are presented with in Part C. For example, there are CMF values for the variations in lane width on multi-lane highways. The CMFs for lane widths on multi-lane roadways cannot be applied to the variations in lane width on rural two-lane roadways. Even though both sets of CMFs deal with lane width, they are different. What that means is, is lane width affects safety performance differently on different roadway types. So it's very important that we keep the different CMFs straight so we don't get them confused and we don't misapply them. CMFs are one of the, well, CMFs are one of those measures where you measure twice and you cut once kind of thing. You know, you want to double check that you have the correct CMF before you start plugging and chugging through the calculations. Um, another thing I want to point out is that the SPFs within the Highway Safety Manual are considered national SPFs. They are not Kentucky specific. The SPFs in these three chapters were developed according to specific base conditions common across the United States. When you have a roadway or project that is different than base conditions, you have to apply a crash modification factor to properly adjust the SPF. We'll touch on some of these base conditions in a few slides from now. The same thought process applies to calibration factors. Since the SPFs in the Highway Safety Manual are national, agencies such as KYTC can use our specific crash history to develop a calibration factor that will adjust the SPF model to better fit Kentucky's crash history and therefore provide better crash prediction. All right, so uh, what is Part C all about and how are we going to use it? Well, here's a list of the... Uh, common uh, items the predictive method can be used for. Uh, this is not everything you can do with the predictive method, just more the more common items. <clears throat> the first bullet is probably the most important thing for you all to sort of take from this. Um, using the methods within Part C and reviewing the results can let you know if you have a project that currently performs average, below average, or above average in terms of crashed history when compared to similar roadways across the state. Jared talked about the, uh, he showed the graph showing the PCR uh, and how that's sort of illustrated a few slides ago. Um, basically what PCR is, is the number of crashes a roadway is experiencing either above or below the predicted model. If a roadway has a positive PCR, that means it has more crashes than the statewide average for that roadway type and that ADT. If the PCR is negative, the roadway is having fewer crashes than the statewide average. Obviously, we need to be spending more effort performing safety analysis on the roads with positive PCR values, since these are the roadways with more crashes than expected. In other words, if you're working on a project with a PCR value that is negative or barely positive, that tells us that particular roadway really doesn't have a current safety problem. And as long as we don't do anything that worsens the design of the existing roadway, we would not expect the crash rate to worsen. Further, if the historical data, crash data and resulting PCR indicates that safety is not an issue, then the safety analysis you perform for your project doesn't really have to be as robust as a project that has a large PCR. It is the roadways with larger PCRs that you want to spend more time analyzing safety and doing more of the other three bulleted items listed here. Now, for the last two bulleted items, it's important to keep in mind that you don't want to get too caught up in the actual crash numbers that are predicted. What is important is the comparison of the predicted crashes of one design alternative versus another design alternative and how those differences compare to cost. Here's kind of a simple example. Um, we have an existing roadway, let's call it a six-mile section of rural two-lane roadway. A quick query of the crash data shows it has, that it's had 100 crashes in the past five years. We've looked at a bunch of different design options, and through other decision factors such as right-of-way constraints, environmental issues, public opinion, etc., we've narrowed our uh, 
the number of design alternatives we're considering down to just two. In our example here, alternate one is estimated to cost $30 million, and the number of crashes that are predicted from the methods in Part C is 50 crashes over a five-year period. So essentially, this design is predicted to mitigate 50 crashes. Alternate two is estimated to cost $20 million, and the number of crashes predicted over a five-year period is 60. So this design is predicted to mitigate 40 crashes. Not as much as alternate one, but a decent amount. Now, we've looked at, in our example, let's say we've looked at multiple different designs, and design one is the best we could come up with in terms of safety. This was the alternate that we found that could mitigate the most number of crashes. It's kind of our, from a safety point of view, it's the best we can get in reducing crashes, which is kind of like saying we're just going to have to live with 50, which again, that's a prediction, but so don't get too caught up in that. But So through comparison, though, we find that design two mitigates 40 crashes, which is 80% of the crashes that design one would eliminate, but design two is only two-thirds of the cost. Looking at that, what we can get is we can get 80% of the way there for two-thirds the money. What that means, design two has a better bang for the buck. But now, with that said, we may still pick design one, but at least we did so informed. The other thing to remember is that if we pick design two, we're leaving $10 million in the bank that we can use to improve another roadway, which will give us the potential to mitigate a certain number of crashes on that other roadway. Considering this, I think it's an easy argument to make that we can ultimately do the most good if we consistently choose the design options that give us the best bang for our buck. This doesn't apply just to safety, but really any uh, portion of a project's decision making. All right, so let's just jump right into uh, uh, the prediction methodology that's in Part C. Um, here is the basic formula. Um, this basically is how you predict crashes for a specific site. It's labeled as I in the formula. Uh, you start with the number of crashes that are predicted from an SPF. This is represented by the N SPF in the equation. Remember that I mentioned earlier that SPFs are developed using data from roadways of the same base condition. If the roadway in your project is different from base conditions, which it most likely will be, then you'll need to use crash modification factors to account for all the various differences in base conditions. That's why the formula has this CMF1 times CMF2 times all the way to CMF whatever. Um, for example, Base conditions may be 12-foot lanes, but you're considering the use of 11-foot lanes. Also, base conditions may include 6-foot paved shoulders, but you're considering 4-foot paved shoulders. For each of these and any other differences between your project and the base conditions of the SPF, you would need to apply an appropriate CMF. The last part of the equation, C sub I, is the calibration factor. Recall the SPFs within the Highway Safety Manual are based on national data, so they may not always do a great job of predicting crash performance on Kentucky's roadways. This calibration factor helps us to adjust the cal calculation for this issue. Of course, if we can get SPFs built that are Kentucky-specific, the calibration factor becomes a non-issue. Obtaining Kentucky-specific SPFs is one of our current goals. Um, but we're just not there yet. Uh, over the next few slides, I'll discuss the various components to the prediction model, this in SPFs, the CMFs, and the calibration factor. Uh, first, let's uh, talk about the first variable in the prediction formula, the, the in SPF. This represents the uh, number of predicted the number of predicted crashes from the applicable SPF. All right, so what is an SPF? Well, an SPF is an equation that predicts the number of crashes for a section of roadway when given a specific ADT and length. SPFs are determined using crash and roadway data from multiple sites. The site should pretty much be the same. They need to have the same lane width, same shoulder width, same shoulder type, same basic grade. These are what's known as base conditions. The only thing that generally differs from site to site when you're building an SPF is ADT, length, and of course the crash history of each site. Keep in mind that SPFs are developed for different roadway types, so you have to use the SPF that is developed for the 
roadway type that your project is about. You don't want to use a rural two-lane roadway SPF on an urban multi-lane arterial. It's just not going to work. Also, SPFs can and should be adjusted with appropriate CMFs to account for the differences between base conditions and your project. As I just mentioned, different SPFs are developed for different roadway types. Um, so to find the value in SV SPF and our predicted methodology, we have to find and apply the correct SPF. Now, until Kentucky can develop Kentucky-specific SPFs, we're going to have to use the SPFs from the Highway Safety Manual that you can find in Chapters 10, 11, and 12. The equation on this slide is the SPF for rural two-lane roadways that's within the HSM. I figured I'd show it since rural two-lane roadways are our most common roadway in Kentucky. As you can see, ADT and length of roadway segment are the two variables in the equation. Research suggests that these two elements affect crash performance more than anything else. The reason is quite simple. These two elements best represent exposure. If you drive long enough, aka, AKA length, or if you crowd the roadway enough, aka ADT, a crash or crashes are somewhat inevitable. So the SPF is trying to model that crash performance based on these variables. Here is an example of an SPF for rural parkways in Kentucky's. I know all of you all are probably familiar with critical rate factor, and Jared talked about, you know, that we're kind of moving away from that. And that may sound scary, but you need, just need to realize that the information obtained from an SPF is used very similar to how we use CRF data. At the most basic level, we use both SPF and CRF to determine which sites have more crash history than we would expect. Essentially, an SPF is the line of best fit for our crash and roadway data. That's also kind of what the critical rate factor is all about. It's essentially a, an average or line of best fit of crash and roadway data. Any dots above the SPF line are sites that have more crashes than would be expected. Any dots below the SPF line are sites with fewer crashes than would be expected. Similarly, a site with a CRF above one tells us that site has more crashes than average. A CRF below one tells us that site has fewer crashes than expected. There's not a ton of difference between SPF and CRF. The big difference, though, is SPFs are not linear, while CRF assumes crash rate increases linear as ADT increases. The research behind SPF shows that crash performance is not linear. That's why we're moving to SPFs. In this example, you can see that crashes increase somewhat exponentially as ADT increases. Here are a few other example SPFs. You can see that the shape of an SPF can vary. Some SPFs are convex, some are concave, some are nearly linear, but technically speaking, those lines are not linear. Remember, the uh, SPF is basically a line of best fit, and a nonlinear line generally fits random data better than a linear line. Okay, let's go back to our overall prediction model equation. On the last few slides, we've got an overview of SPFs, which allow us to calculate the in SPF variable. Uh, but what about CMFs? If you recall, I mentioned that you need to apply a CMF for any elements of your project roadway that differ from base conditions used to build the SPF. If you're using an SPF from the Highway Safety Manual, the manual lists the base conditions that were used to develop each of the SPFs within the manual. Here's an example for uh, rural two-lane roads. Um, these are all the base conditions. You find this list in the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, you're probably very rarely going to have a project where your project matches these base conditions exactly. You may have a lot of projects with 12-foot lanes, but your shoulder width may not be 6 foot, and it may not be paved. It could be something different. The road height, roadside hazard rating may be different. You may have a lot more driveways or a lot fewer driveways than what's listed here. Um, the point is, is that you've got to consider all these things when uh, using the CMFs and adjusting the SPF. 
Um, Part C, Chapter 10, deals with rural two-lane roadways. Within Chapter 10 is an extensive discussion and listing of the CMF values that should be applied to the rural two-lane SPF when your project differs from rate base conditions. It may be a little hard to see, but this table is simply a summary of the CMFs that you may need to apply when using the SPF for rural two-lane roadways. When you use other SPFs, say the multi-lane uh, rural roadway SPF, um, there's similar tables within the HSM that summarize the possible CMFs that you may need to use for those other SPFs. Basically, each chapter will have a table like this to help guide you in which CMFs you definitely need to look into before you just start doing the calculations. Um, what I like about these tables is that the rightmost column lists uh, where you can find the CMF values and or the equations that uh, are within the Highway Safety Manual to help you determine the appropriate CMF value. All right, so when you actually begin to calculate and apply the various CMFs for the changes to base conditions, what you find is things start to get a little tricky and you have to be very careful how you go about calculating the correct CMF value. As an example of what I'm talking about, consider how we would calculate the CMF for lane width along a two-lane rural road. Here's the formula at the top. CMF 1R is what is the value we want. That's the actual CMF that goes into the prediction methodology equation. CMF RA is the crash modification factor for the effect of lane width. You find it in this table, but this value only applies to the crashes that are related to lane width. P sub RA here is the proportion of crashes related to lane width divided by the total crashes along the route. I'm sure some of you are thinking, wait, what? Here's the gist of it. The number of crashes on a given roadway will change based on lane width. That's a simple concept. Narrow lanes have the potential to cause more crashes. Wider lanes probably cause fewer crashes. But what this equation is pointing out is that narrow lanes do not affect all crash types. For example, there is not a strong correlation between rear end crashes and lane width. There is a strong correlation between run off the road crashes and lane width. So the lane width CMF only needs to be applied to the proportion of crashes where lane width is likely to have a correlation. I know you probably can't read the text highlighted yellow, but what it basically says is this. The CMF shown in this table only apply to the crash types that are most likely to be affected by lane width, which are single vehicle run off the road, head on, opposite direction side swap, and same direction side swap. These are the only crash types assumed to be affected by variations in lane width. All other crash types are assumed to remain unchanged due to lane width variation. So to properly calculate CMF 1R, you have to not only use the CMF RA value shown in the table, but you also have to review the historical crash data for your project and determine what percentage of the total crashes are single vehicle run off the road, head on, opposite direction side swap or same direction side swap. Quick example, let's say you have 100 crashes total. If these four crash types I just mentioned make up 62 of the 100 crashes, then P sub RA is simply 62 divided by 100 or 0 0.62. It's not a hard number to calculate, but it's very important to remember this when doing these type of calculations. If you are constructing a new roadway and you do not have historical crash data, the Highway Safety Manual gives a default crash distribution that's based off just national roadway crash statistics. Um, generally what you end up seeing is the roadway departure type crashes nationally are about 57, 58 percent and that's the distribution in the HSM. In Kentucky we're probably closer to 65, 66 percent, but some calculation is better than none. So, you know, don't get too caught up if you know that it may not be a perfect calculation. It's better than not doing any of this at all. All right, so here's the uh, prediction model formula again. So we've, you know, talked about SPFs, where they come from. You know, it's a real simple number to, to calculate once you 
have an SPF. We are working on getting Kentucky specific SPFs. Um, I just talked about there's a lot of different CMFs and there can be a little tricky to apply, so we've got all that. Um, you put all that into the equation, plug it in, and you're going to get a uh, number of predicted crashes. Oh crap, wait, I just forgot. I forgot to mention this pesky calibration factor. The calibration factor is actually not that hard to calculate. In fact, it might be the easiest part, but the name calibration factor kind of makes it sound hard. Basically, you use the appropriate SPF and the appropriate CMFs to calculate the predicted crashes for existing conditions. Now, granted, I know we have, you know, for existing conditions, we know the number of crashes, but basically you're just wanting to see, well, what does the model predict? How does it compare to what we actually know is happening? Once you get that predicted value from your SPF, then it's a simple division. You know, take your total observed crashes, divide it by your predicted crashes, and you've got the CMA, or the calibration factor, and you just plug it into your formula. And essentially, the calibration factor is a ratio that is used to scale up or scale down the overall predicted method formula to match the historical crash data. This process is very much like calibrating a traffic simulation model. Okay, I know you're thinking, geez, that was a lot, but I think I'm getting a decent grasp on how this works. I hope you're thinking that anyway, because I'm about to make it a little more complicated. How is that, you ask? Well, see, if you have a project of any length, you probably have a few horizontal curves, a few vertical curves, maybe an intersection or two, and of course, a few tangent sections. You may even have a cross-sectional change, or your ADT might change somewhere along your corridor. So the process I've described that you go through to get this uh, predicted math, prediction model formula calculated, you, you have to do that for each segment along your corridor. The SPF for the segments will probably be the same as long as you're still a two-lane rural corridor. If you move into an urban section or if it goes from two-lane to multi-lane, then you will have a different SPF. But a lot of projects don't do that. A lot of projects are the same basic roadway the whole length. So odds are you're going to be using the same SPF, so uh, the uh, N SPF isn't really going to change much unless, of course, you have a different ADT. And then length, each segment will have a different length, so you know that each length will predict a slightly different number because of the change in length. Um, the intersections along a corridor will use a different SPF. They are the, the SPF model is different for intersections than it is for segments. The Highway Safety Manual has SPFs specifically for intersections along the various roadway types. So if you're dealing with two-lane rural roadways, you're in Chapter 10, the SPFs that you need to use for your intersections are within Chapter 10. They've kind of packaged it all nice and neat like that to, you know, so you're not flipping through the book too much. Um, of course, each tangent and curved segment and each intersection may have different CMFs. So when you do this prediction model equation for each segment, you may or may not use the same CMFs. It really depends on that specific segment. Um, so listen, I know that uh, everything I've just said in the last few slides sounds like a ton of stuff to keep track of. It is a ton of stuff to keep track of, but if you take the calculations one thing at a time, don't get into a big rush, it actually goes a lot easier than you would think. The various equations in math is not hard. There's just a lot of steps and a lot of things you got to keep in mind. Jared likes to use the analogy, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's essentially how you have to approach this stuff. Okay, so I'm sure you're ready for some good news. Well, here it is. There is software out there that will help do a lot of these calculations for you. Jared mentioned it earlier. It's called the IHSDM, which is the Interactive Highway Safety Design Module. The IHSDM can do all the crash prediction calculations that are in Part C of the HSM. Believe it or not, we just touched the tip of the iceberg on the stuff I've kind of talked about. You've got a lot of different things with all the various roadway types and the various SPFs, so this software can be a big help. Um, it can also be used to help you check for design consisti consistency and traffic analysis, among other things. All right, here's a list of roadway types that can be evaluated with the IHSDM. You'll notice that ne nearly every highway type that we have in Kentucky can be evaluated. 
The uh, IHSDM is fairly user friendly. It has uh, simple data editors to input the various data into in and info specific to your project. Now here's the really nice thing that I like about the IHSDM. You can export your alignment profile and template data from inroads into the land XML format and then upload it into IHSDM. The IHSDM will read the land XML file and automatically build the project by breaking your alignment up into the proper number of segments. Remember, you're going to have a collection of tangent segments, curved segments, and intersections, and the IHSDM keeps all this straight for you. Of course, if you want, you can always enter the info in manually, either straight into the editor, or you can build the segments in an Excel spreadsheet and then copy and paste from Excel over into the IHSDM editor. Once you have your project built within IHSDM, it will perform all the appropriate cal calculation. Its default setting is to use the appropriate SPFs from the Highway Safety Manual and apply the appropriate CMFs based on the design you give it. <clears throat> In other words, if you have a lane width that's different than base condition, it knows to apply that CMF. Same with shoulders and the other CMFs. Um, the IHSDM even has the capability for us to one day enter our Kentucky-specific SPS. The only caveat is that the rural two-lane road portion of the IHSDM can currently only accept one model form. In other words, the equation can only be one form. This could be an if issue if Kentucky determines that the shape of our specific SPF is different than what the IHSDM model can accept. Um, so if, you know, if ADT and length are not multiplied as just individual variables, if somehow ADT is an exponent and not a simple variable, we're not going to, we might not be able to use IHSDM. Um, I wouldn't worry about that at this point. We don't know yet. Um, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. It's probably not going to be a problem. I just want to point out that we have learned that in recent days. So, all right. So let's look at um, just kind of a case study done by the Arizona DOT. The graph at the top uh, is the grade data for the project. The graph in the middle depicts the length of the various segments that the IHSDM split up, and each radius of the corresponding segments. Um, the portions of the graph with a radius of zero is essentially the tangent segments. Technically, the radius of a tangent is infinity, but it goes in, kind of displays here as uh, zero because you can't really display infinity on a graph. So the graph at the bottom shows the predicted crash rate for each of the segments and each of the options that were analyzed. If you look closely, there are three colors, red, blue, and green. Um, the options that the uh, case study analyzed were existing conditions, adding five-foot shoulder to condition, existing conditions, and adding eight-foot shoulders to existing conditions. Here is a summary of the results. I've got to switch slides first, don't I? Um, they also threw in a, what if we just looked at super elevation improvements um, and nothing else? So there is an option at the bottom of the list for that. But um, alternate A, I believe, is the five-foot shoulders. Alternate B is the eight-foot shoulders. And obviously, the no-build is existing. Um, it's important to point out that the SPF model used in this case study was uncalibrated. But calibration isn't really necessary when you're just going to compare results. Remember how I mentioned don't get too caught up in the actual number of crashes it predicted? That's not the important component. The comparison is really the important component. You can see that alternative B was predicted to reduce crashes by 20.8%. Alternative A was predicted to reduce crashes by 16.5%. That kind of makes sense. Eight-foot shoulders will probably reduce more crashes than five. But comparing these reduction percentages to the differences in cost, may point us in a different direction than just looking at 20% versus 16%. Um, so the idea is you kind of take this info and you use it with the other design criteria like cost and right away and environmental and all that stuff to make a decision. So you may or may not always pick the alternate that has the biggest reduction in crashes. It's just one component. 
All right, let's shift gears here and start talking about Part D. Part D covers CMFs. I know what you're thinking. I thought we talked about CMFs in Part C. Well, we did, but the CMFs in Part C are only the CMFs that are needed to adjust an SPF from base conditions to your project conditions. Part D contains all of the CMFs that you'll need in Part C, but it also contains a discussion and fairly robust list of CMF that deals with the effects of various safety treatments, also known as countermeasures. Part D has five chapters, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Chapters 13, 14, and 15 are probably going to be the most applicable for most of our projects. Here is a list of the various CMF applications you will find in Part D. Each chapter and subsection within Part D contains a discussion of the safety treatments that may be used to improve the crash performance of a roadway, an intersection, an interchange, etc. The safety treatments corresponding CMF is also listed in the HSM, and in some instances, the HSM includes an example of how to apply or calculate a particular CMF. All right, let's keep in mind what CMFs, what CMF values represent. Essentially, a CMF represents the percent increase or decrease a particular treatment will have on crash frequency. Uh, the CMF is used in decimal form. Um, the CMF of one means the treatment has no effect on crash frequency. A CMF less than one means the treatment will reduce crash frequency. And a CMF greater than one means the treatment will increase crash frequency. So CMFs can essentially be applied in two basic ways. You can apply them to the predicted number of crashes calculated from an SPF, or you can apply CMFs to the historic crash data of your project. The second, the second method here is simpler, and sometimes it's the only thing you can do, especially if you do not have an SPF, or if you do not think the SPF you do have is very reliable. That does happen sometimes. All right, so how does it make sense that we can just apply CMF to historical crash data? Well, if you recall, the general predictive method formula, I've shown it here again at the top, um, uh, this formula is basically a bunch of CMFs multiplied together, which is then multiplied to the predicted crash value in SPF, which comes from the appropriate SPF. When you're comparing two design options, and the only thing that is different between the two designs is a specific safety treatment, in that case, the only thing that is different in the two versions of the predictive method formula is the specific CMF of the two safety treatments. All this other stuff, it's the same. It's just these two values that are different. And it's a case like this where you really don't need to go through the hassle of all those other calculations, not necessarily. Sometimes it's good to do that, but you don't always have to. What you can do is simply see how each treatment CMF affects the historical crash data. Essentially, you just basically say, well, all of this will just represent historical crash data. This is the only thing I'm changing, so I'm just going to multiply this value by my historical data. And then you just go from there. Here's a, here's a good little example from a recent HSIP project. We had a rural four-lane divided highway that intersected a two-lane low-volume roadway. Uh, in the past five years, there have been a relatively high number of angle crashes. Basically, what's happening is vehicles from the side street are entering the four-lane roadway to either turn left or go straight, and they're getting struck by a vehicle on main line. It ends up in a pretty bad angle crash a lot of times. The four-lane roadway was reconstructed a few years back, so this intersection actually meets all standards. So we really don't have an obvious problem. Here's a look at the uh, crash history. We've had 14 angle crashes, uh, nine of which were injury crashes. That's a fairly high percentage of injury crashes over just a five-year period. Um, we considered two different safety treatments. Uh, one was an intersection conflict warning system. We call it ICWS for short. Uh, essentially, that is a uh, uh, panel sign on the side of the 
main roadway and a panel sign on the side of the approach roadway. There are loops in the pavement. Um, when someone's going down main line and they go over the loop, it lights up the lights on the panel sign on the approach roadway, so that gives the motorist on the approach roadway an indication that there is someone coming on main line. And the alternate is also true. The loop on the side street lets the main line know, you know, someone pulls on that loop, lights flash on the main line panel sign, lets uh, those motorists know, hey, someone's approaching on the approach road. So it's just kind of a way of drawing attention to uh, that there could be a conflict. Uh, the J-turn, it's also known as a R cut Basically, this is where you restrict the median movement at the main intersection. Only the main line left can turn left. The side street, in order to go straight or left, they have to make a right, go down the main line a little bit, make a U-turn, and then go back through the intersection. So essentially, both of these options can be considered a uh, intersection control device. The J-turn just happens to be all using a curb and median and stuff like that, but technically it's just an, a type of intersection control. Uh, since these were the only two treatments that we were considering and no other roadway elements were really being changed, we went to the CMF Clearinghouse. I'll discuss that website in just a minute. And we found a couple specific CMFs for both ICWS and a rural J-turn. The CMFs that we found were developed from multiple sites where a high-volume, rural, four-lane divided highway intersected a two-lane, low-volume roadway. In other words, the CMFs we found and used were developed from research based on the exact conditions we had for a project. So we knew that these CMFs were very good indicators of what we could expect. So, using the CMFs and the historical crash data, we calculated the expected reduction of injury crashes as well as the expected reduction of crashes for all severities. We then calculated a crash cost savings and ultimately a benefit cost ratio of each option. As it turned out, the benefit cost ratio of each option was very similar. Technically speaking, the ICWS was slightly, did have a slightly better benefit cost ratio, but for all practical terms, they were essentially equal. The final decision made by the project team in this example was to install the ICWS. One of the thoughts behind this was that the ICWS may provide better than expected crash reduction. You never know. This is, you know, these numbers are based on averages. So we, you know, could install it here and get lucky and, and get better than a 2.1 uh, reduction in angle crashes. Um, you know, maybe we get three or four or five. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of wanted to try the cheaper option first, see if it worked. If it didn't, you know, kind of live up to the expectations we had, the idea was we hadn't spent a lot of money, only 73000 and we could, you know, always go back and pursue the J-turn at a later date. I'm not saying that you should always choose the, the lower cost option. That's just the uh, reasoning we had for our project. Um, one could argue that, you know, yeah, the ICWS has a good rate of return, a 5.8 benefit cost, but you're only eliminating 1.8 injury crashes, which isn't a lot, whereas the J-turn is expected to eliminate nearly all of the injury crashes, 7.7 .7 out of the nine. Um, so, you know, it just depends on um, your project team and the other factors that are a part of your project. Okay, I mentioned the uh, CMF Clearinghouse is where we obtained our CMF values. Uh, that's not to say that you can't find CMF values in the Highway Safety Manual. It, the Highway Safety Manual Part D has a lot of CMF values, but it doesn't have a lot when you get into the Clearinghouse and look at all the values that are on the Clearinghouse. There is a bunch of CMFs in the Clearinghouse. Um, the home page here has a quick search box, uh, gives you uh, some op various options to search for CMFs by. Um, the clearinghouse really isn't that hard to navigate, it's pretty simple. The only real issue is that even though it has a lot of CMFs, um, you got to be careful to choose the right one and apply it correctly. Um, once you do a search, uh, you will get a results page that looks something like this. Um, 
Each CMF listed in the clearinghouse has a quality rating. Most people refer to this as the star rating. The higher the star rating, the better quality CMF, meaning that the statistical confidence in the CMF is higher. The thing I really like about the CMF clearinghouse is that it provides a link to the specific study um, that was used, well, the study that documents the specifics about the CMF and how it was developed. The link is here on this far right column. Uh, this allows you to actually open up the, the research report, review the document, and verify that the CMF actually fits your project. Um, there's times where it can be hard to find one that really fits your project well. Um, now, while there are a bunch of CMFs in the clearinghouse, unfortunately not every safety treatment or situation is represented. In those cases, there's not a lot you can really do. It's You, you just can't really calculate a safety benefit at that point. The good news, though, is the CMFs are being developed each year and getting loaded into the clearinghouse website. So, you know, if you have a project and you do a CMF search and you can't find anything, a couple years later you get a similar project, don't assume that the CMF don't exist. You always want to go back and check the clearinghouse from time to time. All right, so wrapping up, uh, I've kind of created this slide to list uh, my recommendations for the initial implementation of the Highway Safety Manual. Um, what I suggest is that you use the IHSDM to evaluate alignment alternatives in Phase 1 design. When you get into Phase 2, I suggest that you start looking at CMFs and uh, doing some simple CMF comparisons to evaluate some of the various cross-sectional elements, such as lane width and shoulder width and shoulder type. Um, also, refer to either the CMFs when, within Part D or the CMFs on the clearinghouse to evaluate any specific countermeasure countermeasure options you might be considering, such as various intersection treatments. So obviously any crash analysis starts with crash data. So where do you get crash data? Well, here are some of the places where you can find it. Uh, the Public Crash Portal, this uh, website we've got listed at the bottom, is probably the quickest and easiest. The problem with the data on the public crash site is that it does not include the collision narratives. So sometimes it can be a little difficult to ascertain what happened just from the basic data. There may be times when you need to read through some of the narratives to get an idea of what factors are causing certain crash types. Sometimes though, just basic crash data, you, you see it, you go out in the field and do a review and it becomes obvious, you know, what's going on. A good example is when there's restricted sight distance and you have angle crashes. You know, a lot of times it's pretty obvious that when you have that, it's people just can't see the approaches and therefore they can't, they really don't know if they have an appropriate gap or not. They just kind of have to chance it and ever so often that chancing it causes a crash. Um, the thing I'll mention for you to keep in mind is that the state police owns Kentucky's crash data and they do not want us giving access to just anyone or even giving just anyone copies of the reports. Uh, so with that said, KYTC has an MOU with the state police that details how we will and will not use crash data. Anyone that is going to use crash data that is obtained through KYOPS will need to review the MOU and sign a confidentiality agreement that basically says you will not misuse or divulge information found in the collision reports. You don't have to worry about the MOU and the confidentiality agreement if you're only getting the data from the public crash site, though. You know, so evaluate what kind of data you're going to need and, uh, you know, determine whether you need to look into the uh, confidentiality agreement. So what's the future for uh, KYTC and the Highway Safety Manual? Well, in short, training, training, training. We realize that uh, this is new to a lot of folks and, you know, the only way to really get comfortable with it is to use it and to be trained. Um, we are working with FHWA to schedule some HSM training that is way more robust than the overview that Jared and I just gave you. I've got a little more info on this particular training on the next slide. Um, before I jump to it, I just wanted to mention we are also trying to figure out how we can get some IHSDM training set up. We may have to go through NHI, the National Highway Institute, um, 
it may be through FHWA. We're still working through that, uh, but we are working to get ISHDM training uh, scheduled. All right, so here's the, you know what? I forgot to change slides, sorry. There you go. All right, so here's the training that we have scheduled. Um, at this time, it is only for in-house KYTC employees. Sorry, consultants, but we got to take care of our internal needs first. Uh, the course will be held at Central Office in the Conference Center on the first floor. The dates are August 29th and 30th. Uh, the course is called the HSM Practitioner's Guide. It's a two-day course that goes much more in-depth into the crash prediction methodology. Uh, we highly recommend this course for anyone that will be performing crash analysis on design projects. Um, some of you may think that you'd rather just wait and take the IHSDM course that we're hoping to schedule soon, but I would advise against this. Taking this course first will give you a better understanding of how the crash prediction methods in the HSM work so that when you do start using the IHSDM software, you'll be better equipped to understand the results and make sure that what that software is giving you makes sense. With that, we are uh, finished. Um, I guess I'll turn it back over to Chris. All righty, thank you, Mike. Uh, well, here, let me pull this up. Okay, well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Jared. I have a couple of questions. I don't know. I mean, do you all have time to maybe answer a few? Yeah, sure. Great. Um, we got one question here. It said, it's kind of a specific question, but it, it actually asks if I-265 would be considered rural or urban. Um, my recommendation would be to use the HIS data that uh, planning has. If it's listed in our HIS data as rural, then use rural. If it's listed in there as urban, then I would consider it urban. Um, some of that is a bit of a judgment call, though, um, but I, I'm just not sure what it's listed in HIS as. My guess is that it's urban, uh, but it could very well, portions of it, be listed as rural. Okay. Um, Another question is, is uh, what projects are ideal for full safety analysis? Uh, if you recall, I'd mentioned uh, way back early when I was talking that uh, when you have a project that has a high PCR, you know, a positive potential crash reduction value that's kind of large, those are the ones you're going to want to go more in depth on. Um, if you have a project and um, you're able to get a PCR value and it's negative, I don't know that I would do much more than a cursory review. Uh, it, it, that route, if it's negative, just doesn't have a lot of issues um, based on the historical data. And that's not to say there's not a lot of potential or you know risk if there's drop-offs on the road or things like that. That's not to say you ignore them, but um, I don't know that you necessarily have to get as robust of an analysis to decide whether you should or shouldn't do something. I think you can kind of go back to engineering judgment on those that don't appear to have much of a safety problem. Again, that PCR values is kind of your best indicator of just how severe or not severe a safety problem on an existing roadway is. Okay. Um, here's a good question. Uh, does KYTC have an electronic version of this of the safety manual? I don't think so. Let me ask you, do we have a PDF of the safety manual? No. Not at this no, time. Okay. Yeah, so we're, I, I, if if yeah. folks need a, uh, a copy of the manual, um, I do know there's an option now that when you buy it, you can get a hard copy and a PDF copy. Um, and our advice is to procure that through the same process you would procure your green book or your roadside design guides. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah. There's actually. I guess we're, let's run through all of them here. How can a safety? How can a safety? How can safety analysis be used for flex or bottom up design? Um, well, essentially, uh, a simple way is since you're starting with existing conditions, as you consider 
well, hey, let's take the existing road and add, say, four foot shoulders or eight foot shoulders or whatever you decide to add. You go and find a CMF for that and just see how it adjusts your uh, historical crash numbers. So, you know, and kind of my suggestion would be to kind of plot, you know, you could say you do a CMF for four foot paved shoulders and it says, well, you know, existing you have no paved shoulder, you're going to put a four foot. So you're going to get some reduction in crashes and it'll give you a prediction. You can plot that on a graph, then go and look at six foot shoulders, plot that on a graph, eight foot shoulders, see what the reduction is, plot that on a graph and see where that graph starts to level off. That kind of that would indicate where is your best bang for your buck. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily mean you pick that, but at least you kind of get a sense of what shoulder width does the HSM predict is the best for this particular roadway. Okay, sounds good. And I'll add this real quick, Chris. Okay. Other, other uh, treatment options, kind of a similar approach. You can kind of look at them independently, and once you start to get a sense of um, – you know, different options that you want to see. You can you can start to uh, multiply those CMS together, and it's it's better if you can use an SPF just because the SPF does incorporate some of that regression to the mean stuff that Jared was talking about, and uh, um, it, it's a little. I guess it's a little. It paints the pit the true picture a little better, but uh, um, you know if you don't necessarily have an SPF or you're trying to do a down and dirty type analysis, just using the CMFs for the different options you're considering is is possible. So Okay. All right. Thank you. And I guess that here's one, there's actually two questions regarding this. Or it's not this one in particular, but uh is this going to kind of be the method that we're going to use and has it been used for for our HSIP projects? Um yeah, that's something that um uh, when we put out our most recent uh, RFP, we mentioned that we wanted to, you know, even HSIP wanted to start delving into using the uh, crash prediction methodology on the design end. Up until this point, we've pretty much only used the highway safety manual for our network screening and finding the routes that have large PCR values and trying to program those projects in each district. Um, and so we're kind of wanting to move into using this Part C and Part D a little more. Um, you know, just like uh, just a regular design project, we're or the, the regular design projects, we're going to have to ease into that. You know, we're not going to go full bore into it. Um, you know, everybody's got to get comfortable with uh, understanding these equations and using these equations. But uh, um, that is our goal is to start being a little more deliberate with our countermeasure selection on our HSIP projects. And, you know, I, I recommend that uh, uh, when it makes sense to do so, that uh, you do that on six-year plan projects as well. Makes sense. Uh, and here's one that's pretty specific, uh, and this is more of accountability and whether it's even accounted. Uh, but can you account for car or bicycle crashes and even, like, car pedestrian hits? And I guess that would come down to whether or not it's actually available. I I believe that um, in Part D there are some discussion and maybe even a couple CMFs that deal with car to pedestrian and car to um, cyclist interaction type prediction. The thing to keep in mind is that Kentucky doesn't have a whole lot of locations where we have a tremendous amount of uh, – ped and bike so I don't know that you will have a lot of projects that use it but they do certainly exist but um, I think I think there are some uh, it's been a while since I've looked at all the CMFs but my memory tells me that um, there are some CMFs that deal with kind of a pedestrian and cyclist related uh, crash types it's probably gonna be more your urban areas too so yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Louisville is probably the Louisville, and maybe some places in Lexington and Northern Kentucky, Bowling Green. You might, you might use it a little more there, but uh, you know, a lot of our rural projects, it's just not going to be anything you got to really worry about. And another question that popped up is, uh, does the does the software come with HSM? 
Uh, you, I guess they're probably referring to the um, IHSDM software. I do not think it does. I th which the IHSDM software is a free download. Um, so uh, I think you know if you want the HSM, you essentially have to purchase it. But the IHSDM is a free free download. Um, yeah. There's probably some folks out there that can download the IHSDM and play around with it and get familiar enough to use it. Um, but like I said, we are trying to get some training set up, and uh, um, we realize we got a lot of people in-house and uh, on the consultant side that that you know probably need some level of training, and so it may take us a while to uh, to touch everyone that needs that. But be patient; we are working and hoping to get there soon. All right, Mike. Uh, there's one last question, and it says, uh, "Is there any method for?" Uh, urban collector roads that would be. um i i know that uh chapter 13 deals with urban and suburban arterials um you know i don't know if that how applicable you could use that spf at the collector level um you know it, that kind of goes back to one where it's like well maybe it's better than nothing um but uh we're kind of hoping that um, with the next iteration of the highway safety manual, some of the road types that aren't represented get represented in the next versions. But uh, I, I don't know if, technically speaking, I could say that there are SPS for that. Um, the good thing is, is uh, as we evaluate our needs in Kentucky, we may be able to develop that even if the highway safety manual doesn't have it. Um, so. Um, just because it's not in the highway safety manual, and even if the at the national level they don't develop that, we might be able to in Kentucky. Part of it will depend on um, how much do we actually need it, and then the availability of uh, uh, good data. Um, there's a lot that goes into building an SPF and uh, to making sure you get a good model. And sometimes if you just don't have good enough data, you just can't get a reliable model. But uh, that is something, you know, Jared mentioned we have a research project going on that deals with uh, uh, implementing the HSM throughout KYTC. And uh, um, that's one of the things we're trying to work out is the process for uh, making sure we are developing really good models for Kentucky. Excellent. And we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, it doesn't look right now like we have any more questions. If there's anybody out there that has a, a question, you might type it in now or raise your hand. Uh, one way or the other. Uh, I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. So be quick. And Chris, they can always uh, a lot of a lot of the consultants and the in-house folks should have our contact info. Um, anybody wants to discuss any of this, give us a call, shoot us an email. Um, you know, we're busy, so we might not get back with you immediately, but um, we're happy to preach. The highway safety manual to anybody that wants to listen. All right, amen, huh? Uh, <laughs> sounds good. And, and Jared and, and and Mike, I appreciate y'all coming down and, and talking to us. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any questions at this time, so uh, we'll go ahead and, and end the webinar. Again, we thank you so much for coming and, and talking to us and letting us know about this. We know this is part of uh, KYTC's future, so we appreciate you kind of giving us a heads up on what we need to do. Well, we appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for coming and attending, and uh, basically, uh, at the end of this, like I mentioned before, at the end of this uh, webinar, we actually have a survey. If you'd uh, attend, uh, just wait a little bit, because sometimes it takes the your browser to uh, actually pull up the survey, so if you could wait a little bit before you actually shut down the, the window and your survey will come up because that gives us some information that we tend to, to like to see. Again, thank you for coming, and we hope you can make it to the next one. So until next time, have a good one, guys and gals.